Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Y'all haven't got to see me up here in over four months. <laughs> Believe it or not, when you have a heart attack that kills off part of your heart and then have surgery, it kind of slows you down. So. I really noticed how much energy I don't have this morning. I was putting on my boots, and you know how you bend over, and guess what? It took me a while to recoup from that. <laughs> <laughs> They're harder to put on than I remembered. If you will, turn to John chapter 3, verse 1. I'm so spoiled. At home, I got this light right over my head just for reading. I was looking at my Bible, and I'm thinking, where is the light? <laughs> but thank God, I printed out on white paper so I can see it better. We thought you were looking to the Lord. All these scriptures, man, I can see them. Yeah, I was actually wondering what was with the light, but it's on. <laughs> I'm not used to that. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Are thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, verily I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We see the pressing need of a religious man here. Nicodemus, he's a very religious man. He's a Pharisee. He knows the scripture. In verse 1 and 2 it said, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God made him. <laughs> Think about it. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, but he came to Jesus by night. He snuck in to see Jesus. As many times people know Jesus is drawing them. They know that they should be coming to Jesus and receiving him as their savior. But they're afraid of the people around them. They're afraid of who's going to see them. They're afraid of what people will think about them. What matters is what God knows about us. I can remember before I got saved, <laughs> we were sitting in church and 
that preacher, he was on about this tall. He was a short little guy, really good friend of mine. But he was preaching, and I swear, when he was preaching, he was always pointing at me. <laughs> and I told her, I said, what'd you tell that man about me? Because I felt like he knew everything about me. But God <laughs> was giving him a message that was meant for me. Is what it was. He was at pointing at me. He used to always say, whenever I'm doing this, he said, these, all these fingers are pointing at me. <laughs> he said, don't worry about that one coming out there. He said, like, I don't know where it's pointing toward, but I felt like he was talking to me because God knew about me. Nicodemus is worried what other people would say if they saw him go talk to Jesus, go see Jesus, or come to Jesus. Sometimes we get worried about what people will think or what people will say if we come to Jesus. You know, some, I've actually heard people say, well, you know what my wife would say about me if I got up and went down there? She'd think I was a terrible sinner. I've been doing bad things. Jesus knows what you're doing. It's not a matter of what somebody thinks. I guarantee you, if your wife or your husband saved and you're not, they know it. And that they really, truly would be happy if you went to find Jesus. Nicodemus snuck out at night to see Jesus. You know, he was a seeking religious man, but he was lost. He was very religious. Y'all ever knew religious people that were lost? <laughs> He's afraid of a public opinion, so he sneaks out. Some people literally are very, very religious, but they don't have Jesus as a Savior. There's people that sit on church pews for many, many years and die and go to hell. That's an awful thought. They've never accepted Jesus as their Savior. <clears throat> we went to the church we got saved in. There were some people in that church. They had been going to that church for 40 and 50 years and never got saved. They may have, after we left, I don't know, but when we was there, I know their families was praying for them to get saved. There was a man in one of the churches I used to look up to him. I mean, I'd just gotten saved, and I was watching people's lives and, you know, learning about being a Christian. This guy, he was a big old. He made me look little. I used to sit behind him so the preacher couldn't see me to call on me to pray. To pray. Because I used to get real nervous when he's looking around and fisting to call on somebody to pray. I'd sit behind this guy because he was like this wide and this tall, and I could be there. Can't see me. <laughs> it worked for a while. <laughs> But you know that man, his dad was a preacher. He grew up in church. And I, and I just recently gotten saved, and I was really watching him, you know. And all of a sudden, I seen him mess up real bad. And I went to him and asked him, I'm like, Brother Junior, how could you do that as a Christian? He laughed at me. He said, don't you know, just because my daddy's a preacher, and I've been in church all my life. He said, don't you know that don't make me a Christian? I was shocked. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that, you know, I just assumed he was a Christian. And I found out he wasn't. And that really devastated me. I better get back to this message. That's another one. You know, he was afraid of public opinion here. You know, the miracles of the master had caught his attention. He had literally, it said, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with you. He had watched Jesus doing miracles, and that caught his attention. I've seen people watch miracles happen, and it caught their attention and made them want what the other person had. I've seen God do so many miracles in my life over the years. <laughs> I couldn't stand here and tell them all in a day. My wife can tell you many, many times we walked in the doctor's office and the doctor's like, I know you didn't walk in here. You, no way you could have. The blood sugar sometimes was out of sight. The blood pressures would be out of sight. Just different things over the years. 
right before I had this heart surgery, they told me that I'd had a, another heart attack. Well, I don't even know. When I have heart attacks, I don't even know too much about them. I've had so many. Over the years, I've had chest full of stents put in. In Alabama, they told me they could not do open heart surgery because I had so many stents. I had too much metal in my chest. They couldn't do it. So I believed them, <laughs> whatever. I didn't worry about it. I just went on. And I hurt all the time. And they said, well, you've got so much metal in your chest, you're going to hurt. That's foreign materials. So when you hurt, you just ignore it. You don't, you don't think much about it. You just go on. You do what you're going to do. My wife always said I did too much, but I still do what I was going to do. I mean, that's just what you are. Well, the last time I went before the surgery, he said, you've had a bad heart attack, and it's killed off the bottom of your heart. Well, that's kind of devastating to think you've got something dead inside you. <laughs> it's like, that don't sound good to me. My wife's like, do you mean really dead? He goes, yeah, it's dead. <laughs> it's like, whoa, that, that kind of gets your attention, you know. And when they did the bypasses, they don't take that out. It's still there. <laughs> it's just in there. It's like weird. But you think about the miracles. If it was a bad enough heart, heart attack to kill off part of your heart, it's a miracle that I was still standing. I'm still around. Hey, uh, I went for a, quite a long time really hurting because I actually told some people, I told John one night, I said, as soon as Rosie gets her heart fixed, I'm going to get mine checked out. That's something just not right no more. It hurts too much. But it's a miracle that I made it that long because uh, when they did those last tests before my surgery, <laughs> you ought have seen my room in the hospital. My doctor walks in explaining what's wrong with my heart. The widowmaker part of it was real bad. It was ready to go any time. But he drew this on the wall in my room in the hospital. He just like got a pen thing out and drew all over the walls. Everything that was stopped up and all. And the nurses walk in, oh, your doctor's been in here. <laughs> That's the way he explains stuff. He draws on their walls. But it was a miracle over and over and over that I could even be here. But you know, it's a good thing. God lets miracles happen in our lives so other people can see the miracles that he's done. And maybe they're going to want to draw closer to God. I, there's a lot more to this surgery that I won't even go into right now, but it's a miracle that I even come out of that surgery, okay? Some things happened. I told everybody Wednesday night that was here about some things that happened during that surgery that was... If it hadn't, it hadn't have been the hand of God in it, believe me, I wouldn't be here. He's the one that kept me alive. This man had seen God's miracles. Oh, Nicodemus, he's watching. He's watching what Jesus is doing. And he's seeing these miracles, and now it's caught his attention. We see a seeker who learns here religion doesn't save. There's many, many, many religious people that's going to die and go to hell because that, that don't save you. You know, there's several lessons that Nicodemus learned that night when he went to see Jesus. He learned that there's only one way of salvation. <laughs> Jesus told him he's got to be born again. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He said... He is the only way. <laughs> There's another verse that Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. He's the way that we got to go. And Nicodemus is just now finding that out, that Jesus is the only way. He found out that eternal life don't come through religion, but it comes through a new birth. Thank God we can have a new birth. Matt and his precious wife fisting to have a birth pretty soon. But there's a different kind of birth coming. That's a physical birth. 
It's a spiritual birth that you've got to have, a new birth, before you can ever even see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus has got to shift his opinion about how to be saved. He's used to doing everything by works, but it's not that way. You're not going to work your way to heaven. It's not going to happen. Salvation can't come the way this religious person thought it could. Verse 3 and 4, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? <laughs> Nicodemus is grappling about the thought of a new birth. <laughs> it, it's really, if you don't understand what Jesus is talking about, that's hard to grab hold of. He's like, I'm an old man. How can I be born again? He said, this is impossible. That's what Nicodemus is saying. He's like, can a man return to his mother's womb and be born? He's like, you're not making any sense. You know, there's many people that think there's different ways to get eternal life. Some of them think they get eternal life through their family ties. I had a little guy one time tell me, oh, you should have known my grandma. She'd take her hanky and shake it, and she would just yell in church and praise God. Well, that's nice. But what about you? What are you doing? What have you done? Have you received him as your Savior? That's what matters. You know, there's some people <laughs> that think it comes through ties, but some of them think they've been born into respected families, and that's going to get them in. They think if their family is really respected, that's going to get them to heaven. Let me tell you a secret. That ain't true. I know when me and my wife first got married, she needed some cash. I said, just take a check down to Ramsey's little country grocery store. I said, they'll cash it. She said, they don't know me. I said, just tell them what your name is. They'll cash it. Don't worry about it. Remember that? She's like, they've never seen me. I said, it don't matter. Tell them your name. Our name was respected. So the stores, when they saw that name, they would just, they would do it. It was no problem. It ain't that way today, but back then it was a little different. Country, country stores and everything, small communities. But just because you're born into a respected family, that don't get you to heaven. But there is people that thinks it does. I've heard people say, do you know who my family is? Don't matter. God knows who you are. He knows if you've accepted him or not. You know, some think that because they've been taught the basics of the Bible, that'll get them to heaven. You can be taught that Bible thoroughly. If you haven't accepted the Lord as your Savior, that won't get you to heaven. I had a real good friend. He could quote more of the Bible than I can. I mean, he would quote it to you. But he was as lost as he could be. That man, it was so funny that he could do that. I mean, he literally had went through the Bible. It had to be more than once searching, but he never received the Lord as his Savior. I never could understand that. I couldn't grasp that. Matter of fact, he's dead, dead now, gone on. <laughs> He was as lost as he could be, but he knew scriptures. So just knowing the basis of the Bible is not going to get you to heaven, y'all. That's not what it does. You've got to know the one that this Bible's about. You've got to know the Word, Jesus Christ, not this, just the words. You've got to know him personally. You know, Jesus slowly begins to unravel this mystery for Nicodemus, so he said, that which born of the flesh is flesh. If you're born natural birth, this is flesh. You know what this flesh is good for? Sinning. This flesh wants to sin. Y'all know that? That's just what it's about. 
But he goes on, he said, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. It's a spiritual birth. When you accept the Lord as your Savior, that second, you become a new creature. You are born again. <clears throat> I thank God I'm not the creature I was before I got saved. I was a different person, y'all. Totally. You know, when you get saved, you should be so much different. You go home, even your dog's going to notice something different about you. <laughs> I mean, you've got to be different. I never knew that you're supposed to tell nobody when you got saved. Nobody would ever tell. I, I didn't know anything about church, you know. Later, my wife's going, you're different. What happened? Oh, don't you know I got saved? I mean, I think everybody knows, you know, but they don't. You got to tell them sometimes. <laughs> but we should change. We should become a new creature. It is a new birth. You're not the same person. You know, salvation comes through that new birth. In verses 5 through 15, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said, Are thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. Jesus is once again telling him what he must do. Salvation comes through that new birth. The new birth transcends religious opinions. I want you all to know this shouldn't surprise us. Did you notice verse 7? It says, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The new birth is something that shouldn't come as a surprise because Jesus told Nicodemus, marvel not. He said, don't be surprised by this. This is where it's got to be. Jesus told, Nick, told him that religious background has nothing to do with salvation. To be a Pharisee, he's got a very, very religious background. He can quote you several books of the Bible right off. How many of us can do that? I think it's the first, I forget, five or seven. I can't remember now. My thing about my heart, it messes with my mind, and I can't remember the things I used to remember. <laughs> but that's okay. Nicodemus, to be able to be a Pharisee, he studied and studied and studied the Bible. He knows the Bible. But even at that, he's still lost. And religious background has nothing to do with salvation. Nicodemus was a religious man, but he was lost. Can you imagine being religiously lost? Because basically that's what he was. He must shift his confidence from works to grace. As a Jew, he's used to being under works. But that has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation has to be the root in God's eternal plan. You know, eternal life has been God's plan from the very beginning. Thank God He gives us eternal life. You know, the Savior fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. Many, many prophets all through the Old Testament have prophesied what's going to happen. And as our Savior come, and as He died and arose from the grave, He fulfilled Amen. the prophecies that was prophesied. <laughs> and Nicodemus is seeing these things. You know the Old Testament? Let's see, the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed. 
The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. I got it backwards in my head. In the Old Testament, we see a lot of the New Testament. If we really, truly, it's like it's covered, like it's concealed. But if you really start to study, you wait a minute. That's in the New Testament too. But you know, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Because once you get to the New Testament and start studying it, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. I remember that from back here. And it goes back and forth in the Bible. You can cross-reference all kind of things back and forth between the Testaments. Jesus mentioned uh, in verse 14, he said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You think about Moses and the serpent pictures Jesus on the cross. Y'all remember the Old Testament where Moses had put a serpent on a post and he had to hold it up? As long as the people looked at that, they wouldn't die from the serpents biting them. But if they didn't, they didn't look at it, guess what happened? They died. He had to hold it up on that post, just like Jesus had to be lifted up on the cross for us. And we got to keep looking to Jesus for our salvation. You know, Nicodemus had been saved by faith alone. He has to be. There's no other way. A religious life cannot atone. It has to be through saving faith. We have to trust Jesus and make him our own to be saved. The very next verse, he's still talking to Nicodemus. Y'all all, probably the children in here can quote John 3.16. But this, Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus here. A lot, a lot of people read the story of Nicodemus and don't realize they're still talking. Jesus is still explaining to Nicodemus about salvation. <laughs> it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Y'all notice that's Jesus talking, but he's talking about himself, really. He's talking about God giving him to give his life. He's telling Nicodemus what's going to happen to himself. He's telling him God's given him. It's probably the most familiar salvation verse in the whole Bible. These words spoken by Jesus to a confused religious man. You know, he's already told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again, and Nicodemus is confused, and Jesus is making it as simple as possible. Jesus explained the new birth with a promise of eternal life. You know, we need to follow Jesus' example when we're sharing the gospel. Our task is not to make the simple complicated. We must make the deep truth understandable. Sometimes people try to complicate the gospel. But it's not complicated. we got to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how much more simple? God so loved the world, He gave His Son to die for you. That's pretty simple. If we believe in Him, what we got? Eternal life. I mean, that, that gets about as simple as you can. <coughs> I can remember being on the reservation. We had to, because most people there had never read the Bible. I'd say 99% of them, maybe 1% might have. A lot of them didn't even know what we were talking about or who we were talking about, so you had to simplify it. You had to make it very, very simple. I had a good friend that would come from town every now and then, and <laughs> he'd want to preach or teach, and it's like, okay, but you've got to bring it down. This man, I know him, knew him well. He's, he's dead and gone now. We've said in his church service and list to his members, at the end of the service, they would say, now we've got to go home and get a dictionary and see what he just said. His doctrine was like this much above him. <laughs> he, he said everything to where the language was, I couldn't even understand most of it. 
I told him, I said, you've got to dumb it down a little bit for our people here because they won't know what you're talking about. He said, I can't do that. I said, well, you know, you're preaching then. <laughs> I mean, serious. Nobody could understand him. Jesus brought it down to where everybody can understand him. It didn't matter if it's one of these children or one of these adults. Jesus made it where we could all understand him. And I thank God for that. You know, salvation begins with God's love. <clears throat> the very first part of that verse says, For God so loved the world. He didn't just say me. He didn't just say you. He said the whole world. He loved everybody. He did not love everybody sin, though, by the way. He loved the people. But he loved us so much that he had to do something for us. Think about how encompassing, it's all encompassing, God's love is, because it's for the whole world. It began, began to the, the cross, and it extends to the world. I want you all to know God's love is available to every sinner there is in the world, and that was me included, and every one of us in this room. His love reached out to every one of us. His love always reaches out to you and me both. Think about how we would respond to God's love, to such a love as this. I was thinking about it just a minute ago. Zach, I was looking over at all your young boys and all. Which one of them would you give to die on a cross for a worthless sinner like me? You wouldn't, would you? God did. He gave his son to die on a rugged cross to pay for an old sinner like me sin. I can't, I can't comprehend that. I can't imagine giving up my son, my only son, for anybody. I love a lot of people, but I can't think of one of them I'd say, no, just kill my son, cover their sin. I, I, I couldn't do that. God did it. That's love. He loved us that much that he let his son be brutally beaten, brutally tortured, <coughs> nailed to a rugged cross for our sin. We were talking about in Sunday school. There were people shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Let me tell you a secret. Every time we sin, we might as well be the ones shouting, crucify him. It's our sin that put him on that cross. He did that to pay for our sin. Sometimes we forget about why he went there, what he did. You know, we got to think about how do we respond to such love as God given his son to die for us. You know, that message should flow from our church throughout our community. Our community should be knowing because of us that God let his son die. You know, salvation rests on the very price paid by God. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Nobody took his son. God gave his son. You ever hear somebody say, well, the Roman soldiers, they, they killed Jesus. Or them priests, it's their fault. They, they're the ones who killed Jesus. <clears throat> Let me tell you a secret. God gave his son. Jesus gave his life. We can say they took it all you want to, but uh-uh. Jesus gave it. Jesus gave his life for each one of us to pay the price for our sin. 
God gave his only begotten son. You know, that's proof of God's love. I mean, how much more proof could you ask for? God gave his son to pay for your sin. You say, well, he did it for their sin. They're a lot worse sinner than I am. Uh -uh. He did it for each one of us. Every one of us. And before you get to pointing fingers and saying, look at their life, they're their worst sinner. To God, he don't see worse sin or more. He sees sin. All sin is sin to God. He don't say, if you murder somebody, you're going to hell. If you just told a lie, you're not. He don't say that. To him, it's still sin. It's all sin. And there's a price that had to be paid for it. Think about how this great news affected Nicodemus. He was religious, but learned that his religion couldn't save him. <clears throat> now he hears the best part of the best news in his life. Now he hears, God loves you. God loves you. That's good news. You know, being loved by God is something we need to take very serious. Some of y'all have really loving homes. You know, my whole life, I can't remember my dad saying, I love you. God says it all the time. He says, I love you. And I love you enough, I gave my son for you. He lets us know he loves us. He learned that his religion couldn't save him, but now he hears that God loves him. That's a big difference. You know what the law could not do, God's grace accomplished. <clears throat> the cross guarantees salvation to all that respond to God's call. You know, salvation's attained one way, and that's by faith alone and no other way. Those that believe in him would not perish. That's what it said, remember? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it don't stop there, does it? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. That covers every one of us if we believe in him. You keep reading in the scripture there. The next verse is like, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He didn't send Jesus here to condemn us. Thank God. He sent Jesus here that we could be saved. His scriptures are wonderful when you really think about it. I really get to thinking sometimes about how wonderful it is that he loved me. But then the next verse says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. So if you believe in Jesus, if you trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're not condemned. Thank God, bro. We're not condemned. But that next part of that verse is rough. It says, But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That part of that verse says, if you're not believing in Jesus, you're not trusting in Jesus to be your Savior, you don't got to do one more thing. You don't got to commit one more sin to go to hell. You're on your way. That's what it says. It says you're condemned already, but it don't have to stay that way. All you got to do is trust him, call upon his name, and be saved. That's what it amounts to. You know, Nicodemus knew nothing about this kind of assurance. He'd never heard of this before. He only heard of works. 
Now there's something new. Grace. Now he can call upon the name of the Lord. He was very religious, but lost. And now Jesus assures him that he can be saved. Very, very religious man sneaks in to talk to Jesus. And he went in in a lost condition. But when he comes out, things have changed. I'll never forget the day that I got saved. Church was smaller than this. And I was like the third row back. Piano was here. I hit the altar about right there. But when I got up, see, I went down and talked to Jesus. I got up. I wasn't the same. I went back to my seat, a new creature, a new person. I'd been born again while I was there. I truly, in my heart, think I was born again before I got out of that seat. Because I'd already been talking to Jesus in my head before I got down there. <laughs> but either way, I didn't stay the same. I changed. God does not leave us in the same condition that we're in. He makes you different. Think about what great relief this must have brought to Nicodemus. The same salvation is available to everybody today. <laughs> This scripture gives us hope for everyone that they can be saved. You know, this is a saving message for every church member that we should deliver to the ones around us. Jesus loves us, and he gave his son for us that he might die for us. Come on, Miss Madonna, get a song. You know, Nicodemus, he snuck down at night to talk to Jesus. If you're in here today, don't worry about what nobody would think. Don't worry about what nobody would say. If you feel like Jesus is tugging at your heart to come talk to him, please come. Please come down and talk to him. Let this be the time. Let this be the hour you get to know him as your Savior. I promise you, your life will change. I'm one of the ones that would say, back before I got saved, I can't do that because I can't live that life. Guess what? It was true. You can't live it. But you know what happens? The Lord lives it through you. He moves in here the second you receive him as your Savior. And all them, I can't do this, I, guess what? He does it. Brother Tony mentioned this morning, something I've said many times in the pulpit, you can still do anything you want to do once you get saved. You can. Guess what? God changes your want to's. I don't want to run down to the bars no more. Uh-uh. I don't want to go dancing and partying like we used to do before we got saved. I don't jump on my motorcycle and ride across the country doing stupid stuff like I used to do. I don't want to go out and hurt nobody. I did used to. I'm a different creature, a different person. God made me different. Some of y'all look at me with my short hair. I used to have hair. <laughs> I used to have real hair. <laughs> yeah, I was one of them guys. Rode around the country on a motorcycle all the time. But I'm not that person. I don't ever, 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 ever want to be that person. Yeah, I walk by Harley sometimes and pat it. Yeah, that's about it. I, I, I mean, I almost lust when I see some of them, but... I don't really, truly want to be that life anymore, ever. But if you feel God tugging at your heart this morning, please come down. I want you to know, it's a, salvation is the most simplest thing in the world. 
You admit to God, you know you're a sinner. Because he already knows it. But he wants you to realize it. Because until you realize you're a sinner, you'll never get saved. <coughs> and you just ask him to forgive you. What's the Bible say? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call upon him. You ask him to save you. And he will. His word tells us he will. And his word don't lie. Ever. So you got I mean, you just admit you're a sinner. Ask him to save you. It's called repent. You turn away from your sin. Turn toward the Lord and live for him. It's a lot, lot simpler than people like to make out to be. Because the second you do that, he moves in here and he lives through you. That's what makes it so much easier to do. People don't realize how easy it is. As she plays, I want to invite you to come down.